Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 ICS Research Forum. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to the workshop portion of the day. Uh, and we have a great workshop for you uh, to kick things off. The title of this workshop is Researcher Access to Population Health Data in Ontario and Canada, Three Ways to Access Data. Uh, so here's how it's going to work. We have about 90 minutes for the workshop. Um, there are going to be three set, three presentations uh, with uh, uh, different presenters. I'm going to introduce all the presenters at the outset. Each of the presenters will have 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes to present. Um, and then at the end, we'll have about half an hour for a question and answer. Um, the way you ask questions, uh, you and the audience can ask questions. You'll see on the top right of your window, there is a questions tab. It's the second tab from the top uh, right. And if you go into that tab and just type in your questions uh, at any point, really, uh, then when we get to the Q and A uh, session, we'll um, uh, you know pick questions to to uh, ask and respond to uh, with uh, with the various presenters. So without further uh, delay, I will introduce our terrific lineup. Um, we have uh, Jacob Etches, staff scientist at ICS Data and Analytics Services. Uh, uh, Jacob earned his PhD in epidemiology at the University of Toronto, Dalana School of Public Health in epidemiology. Uh, we also have uh, Minnie Ho, uh, the director of ICS, director in analytics services. Minnie oversees data access, analytics, and reports spanning a broad range of topics. Uh, her unit supports third party researchers, uh, researcher requests from the private and public sector. And also Rafiq Saskin, staff scientist at ICS uh, uh, Data and Analytics Services. Uh, his work focuses on facilitating research led by external investigators covering a wide range of topics. That's the first set of presenters. Then we have uh, Michael Hilmer, the Assistant Deputy Minister of Health, Digital and Analytics Strategy at the Ontario Ministry, Ministry of Health. Uh, Michael is a great friend of, of ICS. Uh, we work closely with him on all sorts of things. He's been with the Ontario Public Service since 2007, and he also completed a PhD at the Dalalana School of Public Health. And finally, we have uh, Jordan Hunt, uh, who is the co-chair of Health Data Research Network Canada's Data Access Support Hub, um, and he leads the Data Access Support Hub team. In addition to that, uh, Jacob is uh, the manager of Data Request Services at the Canadian Institute for Health Information, KIHI, another great partner of uh, the organization. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Minnie to get us started. Thank you, Michael. All right, I'm going to share my screen and kick off this workshop. Uh, here we go. All right. Uh, so thank you very much, Michael, for the lovely introduction. And uh, my name is Minnie Ho. I am the Director of Data and Analytics Services. And today, together with my colleagues, Jacob and Rafiq, we are going to speak a little bit about data and analytics services and our approach um, to providing access to population level data. I'm gonna start with an overview of data analytics services, and then we're gonna move into some detail about public sector and private sector research. So just a little bit of history. Um, ICS was founded in 1992 to study the healthcare system and to promote effective, efficient, and equitable healthcare in Ontario. We are an independent, not-for-profit research institute. And while our original focus was on hospital-based services, we have since expanded to include community-based health services, health policy, Indigenous health, social determinants of health, and data science. Our mission is to translate data into trusted evidence that makes policy and healthcare better and people healthier. And we conduct ourselves according to our values um, of excellence, integrity, relevance, collaboration, and respect. So we are made up of about 800 plus research data and clinical experts that span eight research programs and seven sites across Ontario. We are governed by a volunteer board of directors and guided by a scientific advisory committee and a public advisory council. As a prescribed entity under provincial privacy legislation, ICS is a trusted steward of the health records of over 20 million Ontarians, including past and present health card data. We are about data. Uh, we love data. Um, so we're talking about 750 billion data points, which translate into about 18 billion individual records or lines of data. And this comprises about 20 million patient life histories over 25 contiguous years. We have structured, semi-structured and unstructured data. 
So what do we do? We're sitting on this big pile of data. Um, so we form a lot of partnerships um, at the local, provincial, national, and international level. And just as a quick note, um, a bit of a teaser for what's coming down later, um, ICS is one of the founding partners of Health Data Research at Network Canada. Um, and so that really does enable some multi-jurisdictional collaboration across Canada. We also focus a lot of engagement with our public and do seek their input when it comes to our strategic direction. We provide information and research that affects policy. And of course, we are a very fertile training um, ground for ICS, um, for other, actually many um, students and trainees. And even working as someone at ICS, um, the mentorship and the training starts from day one and it never really ends. So all these data points really are spread across multiple data sets at ICS. Um, here, this slide really just depicts a number of buckets that they really fall into. What enables us to link these together is a unique algorithm that's based on the Ontario health card number. And I will notice, note at this point that there's special governance required for certain data sets. And that also in keeping in line of the theme of this research forum, we do have data sets um, that really affect, uh, pardon me, that do address um, issues like marginalization or provide us information about immigration refugee status, for example, um, that really do help us inform our projects that have an equity lens to them. And Rafiq will be speaking a little bit more about that later. So to zoom in a little bit, ICS into Data and Analytics Services. Our platform was launched in March 2020, 2014 as part of Ontario Sports Support Unit. And this was a collaboration, a collaborative initiative between the Ministry of Health, Kane Institute of Health Research, and the Ministry of Education, Development, Job Creation, and Trade. So what's the big deal about Data and Analytics Services? So prior to Data and Analytics Services, if you wanted to use ICS data, you would have to be an ICS scientist a really good friend of one um, where you could collaborate on a project. With the launching of the Data and Analytics Services platform, we really did transform access to ICS data across the province, enabling us to provide access to research-ready individual level data, as well as aggregate data, and also to perform custom linkages with external research data. So while Data Analytics Services actually has a number of portfolios, we are going to focus on third-party research for the purpose of today. The next few slides, a um, lot of text, but I've just wanted to show you that there are links that are provided here and embedded. We will be able to share the deck afterwards, but we have access to ICS data, also to reports and analytics. Um, and then at this point, I do want to just quickly um, flow through just mention um, that the Applied Health Research Question Program is an initiative of the Ontario Ministry of Health, and it's also managed through data analytics services. These questions tend to be more focused on evaluation planning and monitoring versus research. Um, and I just wanted to mention that it is part of our portfolio. So the big question, how do third party researchers access our ICS data? So if you are a third party researcher, whether you're from the private sector or from the public sector, you will have the support of ICS staff scientists, analysts and epidemiologists when it comes to the conducting of your project. You will have access to over 75 data holdings and you will also have access to aggregate de-identified data, whether you are from the private sector or the public sector. This is in the form of figures and tables. If you are a public sector researcher, you also have the ability to access individual level coded data. So we have been growing and growing over the past nine years. Uh, we started off uh, with just data cuts, um, one research environment um, that access, um, that individuals could access and securely do their analysis. And over the years, we've added on another analytic environment to use. We've expanded the type of clients that we can serve and the cheeky little emojis really represent our staff that have grown over the years. Um, here, this is just um, letting, just showing you that in the first year that we started, there were 91 requests um, cumulatively, and in the past fiscal, we hit over a thousand um, requests. And every year, um, we have had increasing numbers of active projects. So, for example, in 2014, we were at about 14 active projects throughout the year, while the past year we were at 118. And so just in December, we did pass our 1,000 projects milestone, which we're immensely proud of. And I did really want to show the slide to demonstrate and emphasize that while you have three talking heads today um, with me and Rafiq and Jacob, um, we really are backed by an entire team um, that make up data and analytics services. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Rafiq. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks very much for joining us this morning. I'm Rafiq and I'm one of the staff scientists at the Data Analytics Services at ICS. 
and I will chat briefly about public sector research. Um, and I also want to thank Mini for advancing the slides. Thanks, uh, Mini. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, the criteria for eligibility is um, fairly broad. Um, that said, most of our researchers and clients tend to be university or college or hospital affiliated researchers. You can think of your clinician researcher uh, doing work in health administrative um, research using ICS data. We also support students who are pursuing their degrees, uh, master's or PhD, or those who uh, are in their postdoc positions. Uh, we also work with publicly funded non-for-profit healthcare agencies or governmental uh, departments, policymakers, or other non-for-profit organizations. But what they all have in common is that their funds uh, come from public sources. Uh, next slide, please, Mindy. Uh, in terms of avail available services, they fall into sort of two broad categories, um, uh, access to individual level records or access to full analytic services. Um, researchers choosing the former have access to what we call highly risk reduced coded data. Uh, these data are indeed individual level records. However, some fields have been altered slightly to ensure that the risk of re-identification, either deliberate or inadvertent, is minimized. Uh, these they are prepared by uh, ICS, uh, usually uh, analysts, usually DAS uh, um, uh, staff. And once those data are ready, they will go <clears throat> onto those two platforms that many touched on, IDAV or DSH. Um, very few of our clients are currently on the DSH. Um, this platform is designed with uh, a machine learning slash AI uh, research in mind. It's got a lot of computing power, whereas IDAV is designed for more sort of standard health service research methods. Um, yeah, on either of those, client uh, researcher will perform analyses using the analytic software that's already installed and provided, and they will produce uh, their own reports. Um, in order to further satisfy the privacy requirement as, as well as cybersecurity requirements, the, the researcher does not have the ability to upload or download anything off those servers. Um, obviously, that has the impact on, you know, the reports that the researcher generates. Uh, so to that end, uh, all of the reports are, are manually risk um, uh, assessed by one staff scientist, and then those reports are then pulled off IDAV or DSH and usually emailed or used OneDrive to share that output. Um, we usually turn that around in a day, in case you're wondering, so you're not Hopefully, you're not waiting two weeks to get your output. Um, researchers who are um, looking to do full analytic services will have access to an ICS analyst who will do the, uh, the analyses according to the researcher requirement. Uh, the researcher is responsible for subject matter expertise, and we are responsible for data and methods expertise. And rather than getting access to individual level records, a uh, researcher will get access to uh, reports and summary results. Uh, in both of these approaches, uh, the linkage to external data is supported as long as you have uh, uh, sufficient personal health identifiers, OHIP numbers, first name, last name, date of birth, and sex. We can take your own data set that you will have collected as a result of your own work and link it to our data holdings. We also support requests by researchers that are based out of Canada, and we can, uh, we can chat about that through questions if you're interested. In. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I do appreciate this slide is busy. You will have access to this deck, and I don't want you to kind of lean in and squint to try to read this. It's totally fine. But uh, things to note here, this is um, sort of a workflow of a particular project through uh, a public sector, a third-party public sector. You will notice in this red color is, uh, is the researcher uh, research obligation and light blue is I see a staff obligation, but in step four, which is I think the most important part of this slide is that the, the research needs, the research project itself needs to be research ethics board approved and the researcher responsible is responsible for obtaining the research ethics board as well as maintaining the approval. The next slide, please. Uh, very quick note about the uh, uh, IDAVE. Uh, it does have um, a usual Microsoft Office products installed into uh, onto it, SAS 9.4, uh, 
uh, R and Stata. And, um, you know, as, as I've alluded to it earlier, you do, the researcher does not have the ability to upload or download anything by themselves off the server. Uh, downloading usually of the output is done by a staff scientist. And if you're uploading some supporting documentation, such as programs and so on, you can contact uh, also one of the staff scientists who can copy your uh, documents and install them onto iDAV. Uh, next slide, please. Um, once the data on iDAV, you know, you can ask yourself, now what? Well, well, we check in with the researchers to make sure the data sets are as they are expected. Um, and uh, if they are not, we are uh, prepared to make revisions. Oftentimes the researcher um, has um, uh, different requirements as to what their data set should look like. Perhaps some data elements are not there. We're more than happy to make the necessary revisions. And then we continue to offer advice on you know, data elements that are there in case you have questions about what does, you know, episode of care mean in the discharge abstract database, or if you have questions about how to define certain exposures or outcomes or analytic mo or modeling strategies, uh, either a DAS analyst or a staff scientist is there to, to help you. Um, next slide, please. Maybe. Uh, this is my this is my last slide before I turn it over to Jacob. I'm just including here some project examples from the current or already completed the analytic services third party research projects that are most more focused on health equity. So you can hear you can see here some of the examples of the work that has been going on or that uh, is has has been completed uh, during using uh, data analytic services. So to that end, I would love to turn it over to Jacob for his portion, and thank you for listening. Okay. Thanks very much, Rafiq. So like Rafiq, I'm a staff scientist in data analytics services, and over the last couple of years, I've overseen most of the private sector uh, research projects we have. So next slide, Mini. Um, so to start with, who is private sector? I want to just uh, give examples of our clients, so it's obvious um, how this works. So. Most of our projects, or the majority of our projects, uh, come from contract research organizations, or CROs. These are examples of CROs. Um, IQVIA and HOPE are the biggest by volume. Um, IQVIA, in particular, has a multiple ICES alumni on staff, so they have an excellent understanding of our data and processes. CROs are generally very good at defining objectives, designing analyses, managing scope and timelines. This is, that's their core work. Um, it's also of note, you might not think of the U of T as a CRO, but if a university-based researcher has private sector funding, they do come through our pri private sector um, program. Uh, next slide. We also work directly with industry. Um, so these are typically pharmaceutical or equipment manufacturers or retailers. Um, sometimes these clients are excellent at managing research projects and have uh, well-developed departments for doing that and other times there can be more learning taking place because they're they're less specialized at conducting research uh, and the next slide so restrictions there are restrictions in place for private sector research projects um, we'll just go over them quickly on the next slide yeah so the the first is we have to align with the ICS mission uh, vision and values the important thing here is that there has to be public benefit and public benefit can be a little bit difficult to define. It Maybe it's easier to give examples of things we don't do. So some of what we don't do is what seems to be pure market research with no epidemiological merit. This might include examining drugs at the DIN level when it's not justified or analyzing physician prescribing behavior, behavior without reference to best practice guidelines. Most of our clients understand this easily and it's it's really has not been an issue. Um, the second thing is transparency. So the full uh, results are posted a year after we deliver them to the client and the full DCP, the DCP is the data set creation plan that is like the programming recipe for how to do the statistical analysis. Um, that is also posted publicly a year after delivery. We also post the identity of our clients and the subject they're investigating during and after the project is complete. Um, this transparency principle does give clients more pause. Um, but, it, but it's it's something we insist on. Um, uh, yeah, so the last uh, principle usually isn't a problem that um, the, as we conduct private sector research, it can't take resources away from other business at, at ICES. So next slide. 
in terms of the data we can use, there are a few data sets we can't use. I've just given examples here, um, or D, uh, CCHS, CIC. Most of these are the same for um, public sector, although there are a few minor differences. There are certain user fees that are different for private sector. The cost recovery for private sector work is done at a different rate. Um, and importantly, compared to public sector, uh, we only do an full analytics projects. The private sector clients don't have access to individual coded data as public sector researchers can. Um, so all of the results tables we provide to clients have cells smaller than six suppressed. Next slide. So a little bit about the process. Next slide. Um, uh, clients come to us uh, with with an idea, uh, and and if they're a new client with a questions about how our process works, and we walk them through um, pretty much this slide. Essentially, uh, we have we have a first conversation about what they want to to do. Uh, we'll do some basic feasibility checks, make sure that their case definition can be uh, can be implemented, and they'll then develop a protocol. The protocol is the responsibility of the client to produce. We provide advice and expertise, but it's their product. Uh, once we have a protocol, we give a confirmation of feasibility, which identifies all the data sets that are required, um, as well as provides a, a quote. And if that's acceptable, we proceed to a services agreement, which is a, a binding contract. Um, and the client then uh, seeks uh, REB approval, and that REB approval is approved by our privacy department afterwards. Um, the analysis usually takes you know, four or five months, sometimes a little less for a smaller project, um, after which there is often, but not always, a quality control phase. We don't typically double code projects, but it's common to have a second analyst review the code to make sure that it's completely consistent with the statistical analysis plan that the client's provided. Um, then there's a sign-off and debrief at the end. We want to always make sure we're learning from any mistakes and doubling down on successes at the end of projects. And as I mentioned, a year later, we post all the results and the DCP publicly. Next slide. So a bit on the kinds of projects um, well, we do. This word cloud is generated from our completed and active projects, uh, their titles. Uh, private sector clients are interested in a wide variety of conditions. Some of these are very common chronic conditions, and others are rare diseases. Sometimes we link data from, for example, patient support programs or other project-specific data to help define uh, a cohort or supplement ICS data holdings. Examples of things of projects that are a struggle in the private sector are really specific diagnoses for an ambular, ambulatory condition, um, like a, a specific type of glaucoma, or drugs that are administered in hospitals, or drugs that are administered to patients under 65, very rare diseases or poorly diagnosed diseases, poorly coded interventions, or an, an accrual period that doesn't provide sufficient follow-up time because the case definition in question is, is just too recent. And these are the same issues that affect all uses of administrative data. There's nothing, there's nothing unique to private sector about what, what's easy and what's hard given the data we have. Next slide. So just to give a sense of what these projects actually look like in terms of what's in the deliverable. They look like a typical burden of illness study. There, it, it's If you receive this, you would have trouble telling the difference between this and many other studies conducted at ICS through other, other programs. Um, the, these studies are usually in the neighborhood of maybe eighty dollars to $150,000, and we've been doing about 10 per year or so in the last few years, uh, but also growing fairly rapidly. I'll go to the next slide. Here are just some examples taken at random uh, from completed work. The private sector studies, they're often being used to populate econometric models for regulatory approval, but that's not the only purpose they get put to. And it's common, I think typical, for them to also be written up as a peer-reviewed publication. So uh, this information is it's available on our website after, after the studies are conducted. It's also available to the research community um, through peer review. Peer review. It's important to note ICES staff and scientists are not authors on these papers. These are not ICES products, um, but all the usual acknowledgments and notifications um, are required consistent with ICES uh, data holding obligations. And that completes our presentation of DAS services for public and private sector, and I'm going to pass the podium to Michael Hilmer.
I'm just uh, getting my presentation loaded. Can folks hear me okay? Okay. okay. Hopefully you should see it in a second. All right. I think we're in business now. I see lots of clapping hand emojis. <laughs> uh, oh, great. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, um, Michael, for, for having me at your event and as uh, part of this session. Um, I see lots of familiar names in the attendee list. So, so hi to everybody. Um, uh, I, I'm uh, at the Ministry of Health in Ontario and uh, wanted to go over a few of the ways in which you can access data through uh, through the mechanisms that we have. And um, I, I just thought I'd start by just telling you a little bit about my division, what we do. Um, there, there are, I think, two major functions. One is all around the data uh, collection and uh, standardization. Uh, we we have a group that that collects data directly from the healthcare sector, uh, clinical, financial, system capacity information. Uh, we we collected a whole range of information over the uh, course of the pandemic, uh, number of COVID hospitalizations every day. Um, for those of you who know health data really well the sources of you know daily health information are, are not um not that common you know usually we're dealing with data that is a couple quarters old and uh the pandemic really meant we had to try to activate new data sources uh, new collections to try and keep up with the decision making needs uh so uh that's what our data group does lots of um interactions with the sector, collecting data, standardizing it. Um, uh, case costing is a great example of a, of a, a data set that we, uh, we collect directly from the hospitals in partnership with Ontario Health. Uh, and then we have two uh, internal uh, analytics groups that uh, do a lot of um, uh, a lot of similar work to ICS, but for, for the ministry uh, policy development and program implementation and evaluation. And um, as Michael noted, we work really closely with ICS and with Kai High and um, and many other organizations that do this kind of work. Uh, and then the other major function is uh, overseeing the uh, the digital health strategy for the healthcare system, which includes um, things like um, uh, over overseeing and implementing again with Ontario Health the electronic health record um, and and stewarding the provincial health privacy legislation uh, and and all aspects around information and data policy. So that's that's what uh, I do with my colleagues at the ministry. Uh, so now moving forward on to the uh, major ways that we we collaborate with people seeking data. Um, it says research community here, but really it's 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 anybody seeking data. And we actually have quite a, a large range of clients. Uh, we work with researchers, but um, we're, we're also, uh, you know, responding to freedom of information requests that anybody can put in, um, uh, working with uh, police and the courts uh, under production orders. There are really interesting um, um, uh, instances where, where as part of a judicial order, um, the, the police will be seeking a piece of information, and in which case we're, we're uh, obligated to produce that information, uh, you know, to support missing persons investigations. Uh, so quite a wide range of, of operations we have to support these needs. And um, uh, so thinking about the, the major methods you, you can access data, uh, I'll start with IntelliHealth. Um, this is a, uh, 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 an access controlled um, user uh, a business intelligence interface that that is web-based and um, those of you who who've been involved in decision support in in hospitals and public health units might be familiar with this tool uh, it is a 
um, uh, it does a couple things. It, it, it allows you to access data um, and, and export it. You can create dashboards and um, it's, uh, you can see there's a link here and I, I, I'll, I'll make sure that the slides get sent out to folks uh, via, uh, uh, via Michael. And, um, and then you'll be able to follow the links that are in here. And uh, essentially, if you have a, uh, an institutional affiliation, uh, you're, you're eligible to uh, join on to the Intel Health uh, uh, web portal. And uh, you can see here, uh, essentially, we, we have a, a, a process where, where you're onboarded um, and, and then uh, you have access to to the environment within Intel Health, and I'll just get right to um, the the data you see here. And and those of you again who are familiar with ICS, you, you'll see a lot of familiar data sets here. Um, and this is all available at the uh, linked record level, so you can do a lot of uh, powerful work here. I actually was talking to a respirologist who uh, said she used uh, IntelliHealth to uh, do a uh, uh, mortality, COVID mortality analysis uh, for, for all hospitals uh, throughout the pandemic. And, and it was, uh, you know, our, I, it's, it's it, the, the use cases are, are, are quite, quite broad and, and almost endless. Um, and that was, you know, quite an interesting research endeavor unto itself. I think she was just doing it for uh, internal sort of quality improvement uh, purposes, but, but you could see that could easily be a research study as well. Um, so, so as I said, it, it is, it, it's, it's, um, it's a Cognos environment. And so you, you are able to point and click. Um, uh, you do need to have a pretty good understanding of the data sets. It is a point and click environment, but just like any, uh, any uh, complicated, you know, link, sources of data, you, you really need to understand the ins and outs of the data sets and the strengths and the weaknesses. So you're not, um, uh, you know, you know uh, going astray uh, inadvertently. Um, so I, some of the neat things are uh, you, you can, you can search for reports that other, other people might have been, uh, been created. Uh, you can schedule reports to be done on a regular basis. Um, you know, if, if the environment is getting busy because there are a lot of users, you can schedule the reports to happen at particular intervals. Um, and you can even publish the reports into public folders uh, and, and then sort of do peer collaboration. We, we, we know a lot of hospitals do this uh, and it's, it's a pretty useful feature. And you can export uh, data into kind of your own format. And I, I will note, this is all covered under a user agreement and, and it lays out the parameters uh, of, of acceptable use and what you need to do and what you can't do. Um, just an example dashboard, um, the standard stuff, but you can, in the background, have all the data sets that, that generate this and, uh, you know, uh, query different, uh, different aspects of the data sets. Okay. So that's Intel Health. Uh, moving on to the Ontario Health Data Platform. This is a, a, a collaboration with ICS and Ontario Health, and it was established uh, in the midst of the pandemic uh, so that uh, researchers could have access to uh, high value data sets that might inform uh, planning for COVID-19 and research um, within a high performance computing environment. Um, it, it's, it's much like the, the model, I think that, that Rafiq described in that there's a, a data visitation model, uh, where you, uh, once your application is approved and you've got an approved REB, uh, you, you come to the platform and, and analyze it with, within the confines of the platform. Um, and, you know, typical users of the, the platform are, are researchers from, from Ontario, uh, different institutions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and knowledge users in, in some of the major, you know, policy and delivery organizations in Ontario. Um, so again, once you get a hold of these slides, if you're interested, you can uh, uh, follow this process here. Uh, there's an application process, um, and then uh, there is a uh, process where you have to go through and, and do a research and privacy agreement um, between the sponsoring institution and the ministry. And then, then you can get access to the data sets on the platform. Um, 
Okay. Uh, now the third third model is is uh, what we call the Information Management Support Center (IMSC). Uh, this is a um, uh, uh, this is an intake service. Uh, so you you essentially uh, email the uh, IMSC team and and start a conversation about what you're looking for, and they will do their best to to help you. And again, all all, all these different aspects here around uh, you know if if you want uh, hospitalization data or a linked data set, or maybe you're looking for um, some sort of, uh, financial or statistical data, it basically email starts with a, starts with a request and then, and then team member will get back to you and, and you'll engage in a conversation. Uh, so you can see here wide range of users, uh, we get like internal staff to the ministry and beyond, uh, auditor general, CPSO, law enforcement, uh, service Ontario media, you know, di different, uh, prescribed entities like ICES and others. Um, and, uh, and just a few examples of the, the kinds of, uh, data request activities that happen here. Like actually we, we just got one from a researcher at St. Mike's this morning, uh, looking to do some, some, uh, equity, uh, vaccine research. And, and so we've logged it and we'll start working with her to try and figure out how to meet her needs. And, uh, again, once you get the slides. Uh, you'll you'll have access to this email here, but but you know if you if you're looking to get started quicker, I am support at Ontario.ca. And then finally, this is our our kind of our most intense model where members of my team who themselves are uh, epidemiologists and health services researchers uh, will work directly with you, and and we we do this on topics that we find to be highly aligned to our policy agenda. And uh, and then we'll we'll jointly conceive of a of a study, uh, uh, design the methodology. Uh, we'll typically do the analysis uh, in house, and and then uh, uh, discuss the findings. and And the goal here is to both have a policy relevant finding that we can use to help inform our colleagues and, and their policy development and implementation work and a publication uh, at the end of it where we would all jointly publish in, in, in a journal following the, the standard research publication model. Um, so um, this one this one tends to be uh, th this one's highly bespoke because you're it's it's the full uh, study conception to completion, you know, working very intensely. We can only do a few of these at the time because of the time uh, commitment and intensity, um, but they're really uh, amazing collaborations for us because we get to work with you know great scientists learn new methods um scientists get to uh you know work really uh, intimately with policymakers and and you know understand what makes findings policy relevant or not and so that really helps with their uh, efforts to have health system impact and get better at knowledge translation um so um uh i'll i'll, I'll you know, uh, if you are interested, we've, we've got a contact name there, but, um, like I say that the, we, we have to be very selective. There it has to be highly aligned to our policy agenda and, and fit with our general operational demands, but it is a very rewarding, uh, uh, stream of work for us in terms of, you know, getting findings into the, into the ministry and into the healthcare system. Uh, just a couple examples. Um, you know, we're looking at, uh, like there was a, a recent paper in the New England Journal looking at um, uh, cannabis poisonings uh, in, in in youth uh, following legalization of edibles, and and so you know some people approached us, and we were you know really interested in they were really interested in, in the um, is a is a similar phenomenon ha happening amongst the elderly. So we're we're working on that. Um, we're looking at concussions because uh, there there's a, a, you know a, a, an actual um, new it's not new anymore, but uh, a law to do with concussions, Rowan's law about, um, you know, protecting youth from from concussions. And, and so we're looking at it again in the elderly. Um, the vitamin D analysis is, is, is kind of a classic time series analysis looking at uh, when the ministry many years ago made a change to um, uh, the lab requisition form uh, saying that vitamin D could only be ordered for uh, clinically indicated conditions because the 
rates of vitamin D testing were skyrocketing. And we were just looking at the impact of that particular change um, and, and some, uh, some, other, some other really neat examples there as well. Uh, so I'm going to stop there and uh, I'm going to hand it over to Jordan Hunt to bring us home. Great. Thank you, uh, Michael. And thank you to ICES for having me as part of this uh, great panel and for their partnership in, uh, in HDR in Canada and Dash. Just try to get my slides up here. Um, I see there's a bit of a delay on the video, so I'll try my best to keep my dancing in sync with the presentation as I go. Um, okay, I hope everyone can see this now. One sec. Okay, great. Um, so, so yeah, so I'm uh, I'm Jordan Hunt. I'm the co-chair of Health Data Research Network Canada's Data Access. Sorry. What was that, Michael? Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Jordan Hunt. I'm the uh, co-chair for uh, Health Data Research Network Canada's Data Access Support Hub. Uh, and Manager of Data Request Services at KaiHi. Uh, today, I'm going to be uh, talking a bit about HDR in Canada and Dash, uh, what they are, and about our data request or data access process. Uh, tell you a bit about the resources available through Dash and the services we provide and that our centers provide. And finally, just leave you with some tips on how to make sure uh, you know, the intake of your request would go smoothly uh, you know, should you ever wish to use our service. So Health Data Research Network Canada's mission is to bring together people and organizations across Canada for transformative and world leading health data use. Uh, the network was established, recognizing both the strengths of our individual organization, um, but also the barriers that are facing research interested in multi regional uh, research. Um, and so Dash was created to try and overcome some of these barriers um, in support of HDR and Canada's mission and one of their important strategic goals of developing and improving services to support data access. So Dash is a one-stop shop for researchers who want to access multi-regional data from multiple data centers. Now, it's important to note that Dash itself, you know, Dash Central does not hold any data. The data resides uh, at the data centers, and we continue to follow the region-specific legislation and policies when it comes to data access and release. Um, but currently, there's 13 organizations from across Canada that are part of DASH, and they work together to support uh, multi-regional data requests. So these include provincial and territorial data centers such as ICES, Pop Data BC, and the New Brunswick Institute for Research Data and Training, as well as pan-Canadian organizations such as KaiHi, and Statistics Canada. And Dash coordinates discussions between research teams and these data centers to make the data access journey easier and more efficient. So if it turns out that StatsCan or KaiHi will meet all of your data needs, uh, then we would direct you there. And of course, if you knew that to be the case up front, you're free to reach out to them directly. But if you need access to data from multiple centers, or you're not sure who holds you know, what data, um, then reach out to Dash and we'll help you access the data you need wherever it resides. Uh, since the launch of Dash, we've developed streamlined and harmonized processes to provide better support and coordination for researchers accessing multiple regional data. Uh, we've also developed resources and tools which over time are helping to automate some parts of the data request process. Uh, and I'll talk in more detail on some of these shortly, uh, but just to highlight some of the innovations of Dash and its partner organizations, uh, they'd include a single data request form covering multiple data centers, a project tracker that allows for sites and researchers to easily know the status of their project across the sites uh, across Canada. And, and uh, through some of the early projects, Dash has facilitated new data linkages and new data flows that hadn't uh, previously been accomplished. 
And just a quick note on the project tracking. Uh, currently, research would, uh, researchers would ask us for status updates, and we can quickly and easily provide them by checking the tracker. But we are planning for this year to allow the researchers to view project status at GC, at GC Center online, which will just further streamline that. Um, so this slide provides an overview of the main steps involved in the, in the DASH uh, data request process. I don't expect you to read it, but uh, as you know, just to highlight a few things. As a first step, the research team would submit an intake form through our website. Uh, the first time you do this, you'd have to create an account. Um, but then once the form is submitted, we'll set up, we would set up a call with your team and the data centers to discuss which sites have the types of data you're looking for, what's possible in terms of data flows, and clarify kind of any other key details uh, of the project. And then from there, uh, sites would confirm eligibility and feasibility of the projects and sort of develop some cost estimates. And all of this would typically take three to four weeks. Um, once the project is deemed feasible, uh, you've got your funding and you're ready to proceed, uh, the project would move to the data access request or DAR stage. Uh, and in the second stage, uh, researchers would complete that single form I mentioned, the DASH uh, DAR, where specifics of the request, so the data elements, uh, you know, any methods that need to be clarified are confirmed. Uh, and then DASH and the data centers would coordinate to complete any uh, local reviews and approvals that are required. Um, excuse me get any necessary agreements in place, and then move to preparing the data. Um, the time to complete this stage can vary due to a number of things, uh, the big one being complexity of the project. Um, for example, if linkage is required or external data, either collected by the researcher or coming from a data provider outside of a DASH center uh, needs to be imported, this impacts the number and types of agreements, which would then, of course, impact the timelines. Uh, and some of the steps involved can be out of sort of the center's control. So if ministry or other data providers are involved, for example. Uh, but once we have reviewed the project details, we are in a better position uh, to provide you with an estimated timeline for the project. And even if process steps are outside of our controls, what we still can help with is making sure that if ministry approvals is required, for example, um, that you've provided all the necessary information and meet all of the eligibility requirements so that that process goes as smoothly as possible. And you don't wait for months for a review only, you know, only to find out that you didn't include something in your, in your submission package. So what data is available through DASH? Uh, well, there's over uh, 550 data assets held across the 13 data centers. And certainly you've heard some of the detail around uh, what is ICS, which would certainly have uh, a larger number of, of holdings than, than many of the other sites. Um, and these span sort of administrative data, so that the typical hospitalization, uh, or emerge, you know, physician billings, drug claims and dispensing data, that type thing. Uh, clinical data, including data from EMRs, electronic medical records, uh, social data, so education, immigration, um, and this would be data that can help really sort of expand research on uh, equity related questions, um, you know, beyond sort of the typical stratifiers that I noted on the slide. Um, and new data sources are being updated on a regular basis. HGRN Canada uh, works closely with our sites, uh, the centers, um, to support new data acquisition. Uh, as an example, uh, we're partnering with uh, the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Health, CANPATH, and uh, CLSA, Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, to bring their cohort data into provincial data centers where it's not yet in place uh, to make linkage uh, to those data sets easier. Similarly, we're exploring bringing in IRCC uh, immigration data to additional data centers. And so this is very exciting. Uh, CanPath, for example, provides data, including genomic data, on over 300,000 uh, Canadians. And so being able to access that data, link it with administrative and other data, presents some really great uh, opportunities. And uh, I think I said, uh, you know, researchers are also able to bring in their own data uh, into the data center to be linked uh, to administrative data, um, provided that uh, appropriate consent and agreements are in place. And as Rafiq mentioned, uh, provided that you've collected sufficient information, of course, to allow for linkage to occur at the technical level. Um, so for more complete information on the data available through DASH, you can find a uh, data asset inventory on our website. Uh, so on this slide, you can see the inventory. It's uh, searchable. 
And again, you, you can't read it, but the slide is showing a search where, you know, someone searched for the keyword laboratory and nine data assets related to lab data are returned. Uh, from there, you could then click on the individual assets for more information. And this can be a great resource, I think, uh, to get a sense of the data available uh, when your project uh, is being, you know, is under development, you're trying to scope it. Um, another resource is the algorithm inventory, which includes published algorithms for things like case definitions, health service utilization, uh, determinants of health. Uh, all algorithms included in the inventory have been validated, uh, sort of tested for feasibility of implementation in either a national study or uh, multiple provincial or territorial studies. Um, our website also includes information on privacy legislation as it applies to the use of health uh, data, advice on data sharing, uh, and informed consent wording for administrative data linkage. Um, and all these resources have been uh, created to assist researchers with their initial project development. So we encourage you to uh, you know, browse the website to find these resources as well as information on the specific requirements at the local centers and the different services uh, offered at each center, like the ICES services that you've just heard about. Um, and if you're in the project development phase or you're preparing a grant and you can't provide, you, you know, you can't find the information you need, uh, you know, you're just looking for some guidance, please don't hesitate to reach out. So on our website, you'll also find our centralized forms. Um, these were designed to take the burden off researchers uh, by reducing the need to complete a form for each site involved in a multi-site data request. Um, our web portal also provides a collaborative space for data centers to work together to stay up to date on project, project progress sorry, <laughs> across centers. Uh, on this slide, you'll see the forms and tools that are used throughout the process, um, <clears throat> the data intake form, data assembly plan tool, and data access request form. Uh, we discussed the intake form a bit already. Uh, the data assembly plan or DAP tool allows researchers uh, insights to collaborate and document centrally uh, to avoid sort of miscommunication of uh, the project's analytical plan, which ends up informing uh, local data creation plans. Uh, the data access request or DAR form is a newer DASH form. And again, it's that single form and it allows researchers uh, to access or to submit a single request form when requesting data from multiple provinces. Um, I should mention that at this time, because sort of uh, legal requirements or business requirements, um, Researchers are still required to fill out a separate form for requests involving CHI-HI or Statistics Canada. Uh, however, we still feel the Dash DAR uh, form is a big step forward in terms of reducing um, the burden of, of, of documenting sort of your data requests. Um, and these are all integrated with one another, these three forms, uh, so that information that was provided on intake will be automatically fed into the DAP and then into the DAR as is relevant. Uh, and we're continuing to enhance these forms and, and our portal and our process to further sort of clar clarify, streamline, and automate things. Uh, and to end off, I guess I just want to share again, just or highlight some tips for a smooth experience and to uh, to reduce turnaround times. Um, so. You know, if you're going to come to Dash, review the web resources, uh, review the data asset inventory, familiarize yourself if you're not already uh, with with what data are available, and uh, sort of the privacy section of our website, which would outline different rules and requirements across sites for access. Uh, if you want to link data that you've collected, or, or better yet, before you've <laughs> collected it, yeah, you know, make sure you have the appropriate authority or consent to do that, and, and then to share. Uh, with uh, with us for linkage. And to help with that, we do provide guidance uh, for consent wording on our website. Um, reviewing these resources will just help ensure that your study objectives and data needs are as clearly defined uh, as possible, and that ultimately helps reduce uh, timelines. Uh, and lastly, um, you know, we recommend that you consult with Dash as early as possible for guidance on any of the above if you do have questions, in particular, uh, if you're on some tight deadlines, you know, to get a grant application in or, or anything else uh, that you're working towards. Uh, you know, we recognize that the data access journey can be complex and, uh, you know, we're here to make this uh, process sort of as easy as possible for you. Uh, so thank you for listening. Um, here are some ways to connect with us or to learn more and I'll turn it back over to Michael Scholl uh, for some Q&A. 
All right. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you to all the presenters. You stayed on time beautifully, which is terrific. So we're going to bring all the presenters back now. Uh, we have a, lots of questions in the questions queue, and I'll just kind of read them out. We, I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but we'll do our best. And I'll just kind of go in, the, in order of uh, the popularity of the questions. You can upvote a question if you like it in the tab by liking it. Um, and the first question comes from Jeffrey Zahn in the uh, Ministry of Health. And he says, uh, access to evidence is a natural complement to this topic on access to data. How does someone find items in the library of evidence produced by ICES? Is that something the organization does? Maybe I'll direct that question to, uh, to Minnie, first of all. All right. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, Jeffrey. Um, great question. Uh, so, so we do have uh, several ways, I suppose, um, of, of looking through or finding um, work that we have done. Our main ICS website does have a section on our publications, the ICS publications that flow through ICS in general. If you're looking for something a bit more specific, like private sector, we have a link that also goes to our private sector page, um, which will list the completed projects. If you're looking for um, evidence planning, monitoring sort of through our ARC program, we have a web page for that. So it's a little bit scattered through the ICS website, but we do have it there um, available. And most more recently, we started publishing up or presenting publicly um, the kind of recently uh, review, uh, recently initiated um, public sector third party projects as well, just so folks can see um, what's going on and um, enable any kind of collaborations, um, sometimes between third party researchers and potentially ICS scientists as well. So I hope that answers your question, but if you need more information, I'm happy to provide you with the actual links and then more information as well. And I would just add, Jeffrey, that uh, you or you know, anyone is free to just reach out directly to our staff. They're contacts are on the website and, and ask, uh, and we can help you to identify evidence that we've produced or other evidence we may be aware of that relates to the topic. So next question is from Tommy, uh, is from Elizabeth O'Mara, sorry. Uh, and it says, what does the Ontario Health Data Platform have, I guess meaning data, that isn't available in IntelliHealth? So maybe I'll ask Michael Hilmer to uh, respond to that one. Yeah, sure. Um, it's a good question. Um, there are um, some COVID specific data sets mainly, I think that you'd find there um, and a couple other examples. So um, you, it, one of the big examples is you're gonna find lab information on the data platform uh, from OLIS, um, uh, data from the case and contact management system. And you know, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, it's the main, that was the main uh, uh, database that the uh, case and contact uh, tracers would use during COVID when they, so they'd log the positive COVID cases there and then use that as the follow-up. So it's, it's got a, a ton of important information for doing public health epidemiology around COVID. Um, it actually has a, the EC TAS data set, which is, um, the, uh, uh, the, the electronic triaging system that happens in the emergency department. So you get to see all ED visits and their, uh, triage score. Um, and, uh, it actually has the, uh, the NMS in there, the narcotic monitoring system. So, um, I think, you know, so maybe I, and I, there's just a couple others there that I might, might just wrap up, uh, cause I noticed them as well. Uh, so in terms of frequency of update in IntelliHealth, I'd say right now, um, it's not as updated as frequently as ICS data sets, but we, we actually have just wrapped up, a an improvement project where we're going to uh, dramatically improve the frequency of updates and continue to add some data sets to Intel Health. And so I, I do think it, it comes down a little bit to the choice of environment. So, you know, OE, Ontario Health Data Platform is a high performance computing environment. Um, it's got a, a, you know, sort of tool sets built in to support that kind of work. And, you know, Intel Health at the end of the day is, you know, it's a BI tool um, where you can export data. Uh, so, it, it's a little bit around the features you want to seek out and, and how that best meets your needs. Um, and uh, um, I think there was, uh, yeah, I'm good there. I, I, there were some other questions, but might, we'll go respect the voting. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Michael. Um, this next question, I may just answer quickly. Uh, the question is Tommy Tams. He asks, is there a map or a Venn diagram to illustrate the major data holdings discussed today and the platforms organization that hosts them? What makes them unique, different, the same? Great idea, Tommy. 
Uh, I don't. Th I think it's fair to say that that doesn't exist right now. And partly, you know, many of these platforms have, and and the new data sets and so on have evolved really quite rapidly over the last couple of years. Uh, in particular, the OHTP that just really came online during COVID. But I think that that is a good uh, idea, and the whole um, effort of this workshop is to try to give you know, the research community a bit more of understanding what the options are, but we can certainly help help you navigate even better with some better tools. So we'll, we'll take that uh, uh, as a, a homework item for us. Um, next question is from uh, Anne Hayes, and she asks, can analysts and government organizations access data through ICS? If so, what level of access do they receive? So I don't know, Minnie or Jacob or Rafiq, do you want to take that one? I think I was nominated to take this one as we were going through the Q&A on the side. Um, so if I understand your question correctly, Anne, uh, yes. Uh, so if you are anyone that's publicly funded or a researcher that's publicly funded, or which includes government, um, that's the case, can access individual lines of data, individual level data. And internally, we refer to that as our level four data. So while it's individual, we have um, uh, sort of uh, change the granularity of the data a little bit. So it's a little bit different from what an ICS staff member, for example, would access, but it's still individual level um, line of data. I think I'll just so stop may, there. Yeah. May I just add just a little bit to this? Um, it's, I should have mentioned that earlier, that uh, what many refer to level four or highly risk reduced coded data. Uh, in my experience, it enables researchers to do pretty much all usual health services research projects um, that they would be able to do had they had fully uh, identifiable or quasi-identifiable individual level records. So it doesn't take away sort of that much, if you will. I mean, obviously people will have questions about the details of what it looks like, but it's still individual level records. And I think as long as it's publicly funded, uh, the folks at these governmental organizations will have access to individual level records. Thanks for the question, Anne. Okay, I'm gonna go a little freestyle here in terms of the order of questions, just to get questions in from different uh, uh, questioners and uh, and our, our uh, presenters. So this one is for you, uh, Jordan. The question is from Lucas Godoy, and he says, when using Dash, is it possible to combine data from different regions into a single data set, or analyses are still conducted independently for each region? Um, thanks for the question, Lucas. It, it depends on the data being accessed. Certainly, um, CHI-HI or Statistics Canada data sets offer pooled data from multiple regions. And as I mentioned during uh, the presentation, um, we, you know, there has been some sort of new data flows uh, that have been done for the first time. And, and we're learning uh, that some data sets can be moved and between uh, data centers. So, you know, some sets might be able to move from Alberta to Ontario for, for a pooled analysis to occur within the uh, ICES secure environment, for, for example. So I guess the short answer is it depends. It's my favorite answer. I use it all the time. Uh, okay, and now question from Alina Cameron. Uh, where can we access the publicly available private sector work, I guess meaning at ICS? Um, perhaps Mini again or? Yeah. Jacob, oh, Jacob, you go ahead. Yeah, I, I can jump in for that one. So if you go to the uh, ICES public website, the www.ices.on.ca, at the top, you'll see a banner. And on the right side, there's data and analytic services, which gives you a menu. And you can pull down and go to the um, information for private uh, private sector researchers section. Um, and you'll get information on all, all the other portfolios within DAS, um, information on how to start a project, information on past projects. Um, information on how to contact us. It's all there. Great. Okay. Uh, another question, this one from Sherry, who is a colleague at Jeffrey Zons, I guess the ministry. And she asks, is there any way to obtain the research done on long-term impacts of affordable housing? Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure who to direct that to. I, I mean, I don't believe we have data on affordable housing at ICS. Michael, I'm not sure whether that's a question you can uh, provide any insight on? Yeah, it's a great question, and I, th I think we're, I think we're all trying to make progress towards having that that horizontal social determinants of health data set. Um, 
And just recently, some legislative changes were made to, to FIPA that allow um, internal uh, government integration units to combine information together uh, from health, social services, education, and and because previously it was it was quite challenging to to bring together data sets from different uh, social sectors, and now we have the legislative basis to do it. But now there's a like a huge data quality uh, methodological piece of like how how do we link this and how do we combine data sets? So like the good news is at least we have the legislative ability, um, and and now like the really hard work starts, and and you know working with ICS and, you know, all the great people on this call, we, we can accelerate because the, the, there have been examples where this has happened. And like I, I, Yona Lumsky is speaking today is got, you know, she's done a ton of great work bringing together uh, social services data and health data. So it's not impossible. It's just, I, you, you need to go and find the data set, make sure you have the legislative authority to link it and then figure out like how to link it. Because you know everybody uses different identifiers across different sectors. You know all the regular kind of hurdles of bringing data sets together. Thank you. Yeah, and that's another area where you know, as Michael alluded to, we collaborate with the ministry. And in fact, the recent legislative changes also enable the creation of extra ministerial data integration units. And, and ICS is hoping that that uh, status will be um, uh, conferred on, on on us as well to similarly be able to integrate uh, uh, more easily data on social determinants of health with with health data but it is a it, it's a challenge right now so i don't think we can really answer the question or, or provide an answer to the analysis of of uh, using the affordable housing uh, data um okay question now from tara black uh wondering about the intersection with ethics has ics gone through an reb or is it the responsibility of the researcher do you require reb approval to work with your data Researchers at universities were required to go through REBs. What about the private sector? So maybe just, um, again, I, I don't know who, who from the ICS side wants to uh, address the REB approvals that are required, both in the public sector and private sector side. Jacob, I can start. Okay, Minnie, then and, go uh, ahead. Jacob can jump in if you like. Um, so the short answer is yes, REB is required <laughs> um, for third party researchers. Um, for and you're right in that if you are a publicly uh, a public researcher or investigator and aligned with a university, you can go through there. It is the responsibility of our third party researcher to obtain the research ethics board approval. Um, and for our private sector clients, we do have um, certain REBs that we can refer them to. We have no affiliation or, you know, we don't get kickbacks or anything from them, but they are familiar with the types of projects that we do. So we, we are able to refer them to other um, REBs that will help um, provide that approval. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Um, uh, question from uh, uh, Yubin Sung. Is the algorithm inventory available on the HDRN website? Jordan, maybe I'll hand that over to you, the algorithm inventory. Um, yes, it is. And we can put the, uh, we can put the link to that and the data asset inventory, which gets a little bit, not as nice as the Venn diagram, but does get a little bit at who, who has uh, what data sets. Uh, we can put that in the chat. Okay. Terrific. Um, Michael question to you, uh, from Lori Sutherland is the uh, uh, OHTP going to be extended, the legislation enabling the OHTP, is that going to be extended or become permanent? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we're working on that now. I mean, I, I, I think we would hope that it would and that it can continue to evolve to be a, like a really important uh, data access and, and research platform for everybody, but it's, it's, that work is in progress. So um, stay tuned. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm, I'm going to continue to sort of uh, pick and choose from amongst the questions to, to get a good mix here. Um, so uh, there's a question here from Camry uh, Lewis. Oh, no, sorry. Question is from Abhanil Mittal, which is what is the granularity of data available at ICS? For example, treatment data, treatment start and end dates, or just names of drugs, as an example. Um, Rafiq, do you want to take, Should I take that on? Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, thanks, Michael. Thanks for the question. Yeah, we do have, um, I mean, a, essentially data at ICS is uh, encounter based. So, you know, anytime you go to see your physician or you fill out a, a drug prescription, 
we're going to know when that prescription was filled out for which um, drug using the drug identification number, when that was done. Um, so really uh, long story short, yes, we do have treatment uh, data available. It kind of depends, however, uh, on what kind of treatment you're looking for. We have a lot of information of can on cancer tre treatments through um, Cancer Care Ontario. Uh, data that we receive yearly. Uh, we also have Ontario drug benefit information and narcotics monitoring systems. So if that's something you're looking for, yes, we do. But we also have other treatment information like surgical treatments, uh, physician visits, and so on. So um, the devil's obviously in the details, and I encourage you to get in touch with uh, one of us for, for sort of a quick feasibility assessment of your project, which is something we also support if you would like. Okay, terrific. Uh, there's a question from Evangeline Danseco, who's asking about the um, historic, uh, the longitudinal nature of the data. You know, is it possible to get data from the past 20 years, for example? So maybe we'll, I'll ask all three groups to respond to this question. Um, and Jordan, probably you're, you know, vary by jurisdiction, but um, you know, what? How far back does your data go, effectively, that you can make available to uh, to researchers? So, why don't we start with uh, with ICS, and then Michael, you can respond, and then Jordan. Sure, I, I can jump in for this one if you want. Um, so, we we have a lot of different holdings, and many of them have different dates. Um, so, the question is a little bit. It depends. In general, our holdings go back to the early '90s, but it's quite common for longitudinal studies to start these days in 2002 when the hospital system moves to ICD-10 coding. Um, so it depends what your needs are. It depends how far you need to go back. Um, going back before the early '90s is is pretty challenging, though, with ICS holdings. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about the MOH uh, data? Yeah, I I think pretty similar, like like. Uh, it, it depends on the data set, but I, I we actually can't. No, oh, and Michael's frozen. No, oh. like fish. Okay, we've seemed to have lost Michael. Uh, Michael's connection and, there. And you, <laughs> oh, yeah, you're you're breaking up, Michael. So maybe I'll just uh, move over to Jordan. To tell us about uh, from HR. Sure. Yeah, I think I think si similar to, to Jacob's comment, and when you're talking about multi-regional analysis, it's not only um, sort of by data set, but also by by jurisdiction. So certainly back to the '90s, um, you know, maybe for Ontario, uh, BC, but some of the some of the smaller provinces, it could be a shorter uh, shorter time series as well. But definitely, you know, we're we're pretty good for ten years from you know from across the board for for at least the common data sets. Okay, terrific. Um, here's an interesting question from Venkata Duvuri. Uh, we noticed the key role of pathogen genetic data. Is there any plan to pair with pathogen genomic data with these rich data uh, databases? Uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, and uh, I'll, you know, we we don't routinely collect at least at ICS, and I don't believe the ministry or most uh, DASH centers routinely collect. Uh, pathogen genetic data or, or genomic data generally. Uh, it certainly is possible to link uh, uh, specific data sets uh, to, uh, to other data uh, where those are available. Um, I'm not sure if anyone wants to add to, uh, to that, if you know more than I do. Um, the only thing I can add, and I'm certainly not an expert and, and don't even know what pathogen means when, in this context, but um, there is genomic data mentioned in CAMPATH, which we are increasingly adding that cohort to, to the HDRN sites. So there may be an avenue to do some of that analysis that way. All right. Um, here's a question from Anne Hayes. For what purpose could researchers access data without an REB approval? So that would that that would really be specific to, uh, to ICS, perhaps in ministry as well. But let's start with, oh, Michael's back, great. Um, the question, Michael, is for what purpose could researchers access data without an REB approval? So I'll have uh, uh, perhaps many can go first, and then Michael, if you want to add in as well, uh, you can do so. Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, so we do have a stream of um, service where if the project is related to evaluation, planning, and monitoring, a third-party researcher can do a project through um, data and analytics service as well. 
And for those types of projects, um, the privacy review and approvals are used, uh, utilize the ICS internal um, um, kind of system um, and processes to go through. So in those specific cases, uh, a research ethics board approval is not required, um, but it really is linked to the purpose of uh, the project and the, and the request that is coming through to us. Um, for, for the ministry, it would be pretty similar. Like we, we wouldn't release a data set uh, that didn't have some sort of REB coverage um, in, unless it was for that. You know, like I think the Tri-Council is is pretty clear that the, the, the evaluation purposes and, and and QI is sort of a bit of a gray area, I think, you know, I think, uh, but I would say like, you know, we tend to err on the side of wanting the REB and sometimes we'll work with research community and do um, uh, summary tables or, or you know, uh, uh, the, the output of regression analyses and, you know, just to kind of get a sense of, you know, is there something there to this question uh, as, as part of the exploratory analysis? But but if we're releasing data, we, you know, we have a we, we have a data sharing agreement that has parameters associated with it. Uh, so so we're we're pretty, uh, pretty rigorous about that. I think you'd find that pretty, pretty common amongst the organizations. Great. Okay, we've got about five minutes left, so we will uh, we'll be able to get a couple more questions in. Uh, this one is from Jennifer Lawson, and I think probably all three uh, can speak to this. Can any of you speak to partnerships with primary care data holdings and work to grow these connections? So um, maybe can we? Well, I'll start with uh, Jordan at Danish, and then perhaps Michael, and then ICS. Sure. Um so yes, yeah, so so we uh, the centers do hold some primary care data, and it's certainly uh, uh, I would say high on the data acquisition plans for certainly Kai High, uh, and I imagine some of the other uh, sites. It it really as you add cohorts, um, it really sort of depends on the the authority and um, the consent, I guess, that each has, and and so just working through those steps to understand uh, where the opportunity is to uh, to add that data. Right. And um, Michael? Yeah, it's a great question. We, you know, there, there, are, there are these great um, primary care practice-based research networks, which, the, you know, the ministry, you know, sometimes supports. Uh, we don't have any direct role in, in those, but uh, all of our analysis of primary care is, is with claims data. Uh, so it, you know, we get a sense of who is seen, where, and, and to the extent that the, the, you know, the OHIP billing codes can tell you something, which which is often pretty limited. You have, you have to triangulate it with, with other data sets. Um, so, you know, we, we don't internally have very any kind of detailed uh, primary care information beyond the, um, uh, you know, what, what gets submitted is, is for OHIP billing. Okay, Jacob? Yeah, I'll comment on that really briefly. Um, so, we have claims data as well. So we have the OHIP billings from physicians um, that has some diagnostic codes and some fee codes for the procedures being produced, but it's it's not really granular or detailed. We also have the drugs that people are receiving from those visits, um, but that's incomplete for people who are aged less than 65. So there, there are some holes in terms of what we can characterize. ICES does have some EMR records, but in the context of this presentation, we don't use those for third-party research. Um, so that's that's only being used by internal ICES scientists. Okay, um, and this may be the last uh, question. Oh, we might be able to get two in, we'll see. Uh, Alina Cameron asks, who is, who is responsible or is going to be responsible for collecting health info from private clinic visits? I'm not sure if that's relating to like the, the new Bill in Ontario for private uh, service delivery. Uh, certainly, at, at the present time, uh, you know, if you think about a family physician, they are a they're a small business person. Um, they bill the government for services, and that data is collected by the government, and 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 it's available, you know, in, in all of our sites. Uh, with respect to these the new clinics that are being funded, I, I don't I have not heard what the, how it's going to work. I, I'm not sure, Michael, if you. Uh, know how that's going to work, if it's any different, or if the data would still be coming in as per the usual way. 
Yeah, I, I think we're we're gonna have the same expectations. You know, like well, first of all, if if a physician is there, you know, billing, we'll we'll get the billing just as normal. Um, uh, you know, I think the the current independent health facilities. Um, I, I you know I have this interest in my other responsibility as as overseer of the electronic health record, just to make sure that they get you know better uh, connected into the electronic health record and are submitting. Uh, you know, images into the image repository. Like that's not so much anything to do with with research. Although maybe one day down the road, you know, we can figure out how to access images for researchers, uh, which would be, I think, pretty amazing. But that that's not possible right now. Uh, so, so I, you know, it's it's top of mind to you know ensure that the right information is submitted right now. Um, and 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 like like. Michael said, I, I think for the most part, the, the, the usual pipelines of, of administrative data, whether they be for billing or, or otherwise will, will be maintained. But, uh, but, but uh, it has hit our radar just to like double check to make sure that all those right uh, pieces of oversight and data submission are happening. Good, good question. Thank you. All right. Well, listen, uh, thank you to all the presenters for uh, terrific presentations and a Q&A session. Thank you. We had over 300 uh, uh, folks in the audience listening in uh, today, which is fantastic. Um, uh, thank you for, for joining us. There was a question about when, uh, whether the slide decks would be available and the recorded sessions. So the slide decks, if presenters are willing to share their decks, uh, they will be available on the ICS website. Um, with respect to the recordings, they will also be available probably in a couple of weeks. It takes some time to, you know, format them and so on. Uh, but that will be available as well for those who want to uh, uh, have a second look at the sessions or if you missed it the first time. And remember, there were three other workshops uh, taking place simultaneously with this one. So uh, uh, you feel uh, it'll be a great opportunity to go back to those recordings and see those workshops uh, if you are on this one. Uh, all right, so you got five minutes now before we reconvene for the main uh, uh, opening uh, session of the uh, research forum, and uh, we'll see you back shortly. Thanks very much.